the topic will be smart vision, smart glasses, seeing beyond the innovation chasm. And I can tell you that a, quite a bit of work went into thinking into this. And uh, th I'd like to thank everybody here for their hard work leading up to this while we'll a small presentation. Uh, but first, let me introduce the panel. Uh, the, on the, starting on the far right there, my far right, uh, and David Peregrim, the business analyst uh, with ALF Consulting. He's also consulting with uh, Bristol Myers Squibb. And uh, Dave, David is a skilled techn technology professional with expertise in business analysis, laboratory processes, customer service, application support, and work group collaboration. He has a broad background, including collecting functional requirements, SDLC conformance, software development and delivery, product evaluation, and training. He's motivated to seek innovative and specialized solutions addressing the full spectrum of information capture, query, and interactive data and image analysis. He's a resourceful problem solver, recognized for superior custom focus, and an ability to formulate strong business relationships with staff and internal and external clients. Uh, the next, uh, next to Dave is Jay Kim, Chief Technology Officer at APX Labs. He is a chief, uh, it's a Virginia-based software company focused on the adoption, adaption of smart glasses in the enterprise sector. Jay leads the strategic R&D in support of Skylight, Apex's enterprise smart glass software platform, and manages the corporate intellectual property portfolio. Jay is a globally recognized expert on wearable display hardware and adaption strategy. He graduated from Tufts with degrees in electrical engineering with a concentration in mobile and wireless technology. Uh, next to Jay is Donna Flatley. She's the Director of Business Development with Spritz Technology. She has a background working with growth stage technology companies. And she started as an advisory consulting. She started with an advisory consulting firm which provides services to US and international venture capital and private equity firms, as well as operational and strategic support to portfolio companies. Ms. Flatley is a, was an investment manager at Advent International Corporation, a private equity investment firm with more than a $1.5 billion U.S. Under, under management. She started her career in venture capital investing in technology companies and advising Nippon Telephone and Telegraph on investment opportunities. Uh, she directs operation, she has direct operations experience, which includes work with Concord Communications, leading developer of web-based networking reporting and an analysis solutions. Next to Donna, is Tim Colbeo. Tim has over 16 years of experience in medical imaging. He has uh, held several executive positions, including general manager, CTO, and C chief strategy officer. Most recently, he was responsible for two businesses with Merge Healthcare, which is a NASDAQ uh, traded firm. Tim was formerly the CTO of RIS Logic, a Solon, Ohio based startup company which created an industry-leading information system for radiology practices. Before joining the medical industry, Tim spent several years as a research assistant at the Applied Research Laboratory at the Pennsylvania State University, developing virtual reality training and visualization systems. Tim holds a uh, Bachelor's of Science degree from John Carroll University in Cleveland with studies in computer science, physics, and math, and was honored with the distinguished Physics Alumnus Award in 2004. Uh, he has a master's degree in acoustics from the Pennsylvania State University. And uh, finally, we come to Grace Lee, a pharmaceutical strategist and technology architect uh, with PA Consulting. Grace is a pharmaceutical and innovation strategist with over 15 years experience in senior leadership positions in clinical development medical affairs, regulatory strategy, and commercialization. She collaborates with regulators, pharmaceutical senior executives, and technology innovators like Google to develop new solutions for pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies. So 
So you can see we have a very seasoned and uh, well-educated panel. And I have to say also that they were very instructive in um, teaching me about how broad this area really is. It's been going on for quite some time. Um, and there has been one company that's made a big splash recently in putting their name out there. But in fact, this has been going on for quite a while. And I think you'll gain from the experience of the panel. So let me turn it over to Dave with that. Hey, thank you, Tom. Wow, when I heard that, heard Tom read my bio, I didn't realize how boring it was. I've got to rewrite that. <laughs> Tom asked me to do the, uh, lead this panel, and I wasn't going to do it unless I could get the best people in the country here. And the people that you're looking at, because I tried as hard as I could, and Tom helped, these are the, the experts in their field. So the people who stuck around, you're going to have a great time tonight. <laughs> They've been helped. We've been working on this since January. They're doing it because they're really excited about it and they're really involved. And I wasn't going to do it unless I can get these people. And so that's, that's why I'm really happy they're here. Um, I don't want to say anything more about myself. I've been in the business for a little, for in and out of the labs for 20 years working with scientists. And so I see a real use case in laboratories for this kind of mobile devices. But talking to these panelists, I realize there's many more uses out there than I even fathom. And that's why I want to start the presentation off right now so we can get to the, the meat of the matter. I think we have, there should be a slide show that we worked on. You know which one to start? Your slide shows on your glass. You gotta squint to read it. <laughs> I can't make out that letter. Yep. We just need it on the screen. There we go. Okay. So the panelists were already introduced. Let me move my. Let's see if this clicker works. Are we? There we go. Grace, Sorry, take it away. Oh. Thank you. Thank you to Planet Connect and Biofarm uh, Council for the opportunity to talk to you all about the innovations that are on its way to our closest office and home. So what I'm going to talk about is really the journey, the innovation and technology journey that pharma and healthcare is going through or will go through. Um, based on what we know of other industries, based on what we know of the pharma industry, and based on what is happening today. So I'm going to take us through two scenarios. If you look at the book and CD um, industry, it'll give us a nice parallel of, it wasn't too long ago that we were building our own collections of CDs and books. Then iTunes in January 2001 built a platform, and the platform enabled uh, us to adopt new technology to download the music onto iPods. And that time span was only eight months between the platform being available and a device allowing us to retrieve this music. So adopting this new technology, they were, the industry was able to migrate to subscription-based um, music streaming and sharing uh, very quickly. If we look at the trajectory, eight months to a device, four to seven years, to a sharing and subscription model. But the book industry didn't go through that. The book industry took 12 to 15 years to get you a device that you could download onto um, your books and also another two to five years before we could get to lending. Right? So what does this mean for pharma? Pharma went through the same thing, but just as long. Pharma spent some time looking at clinical systems and building our own ECRF, EDC, CDMS, CTMS, drug safety systems. I have a long list of all the acronyms from every pharma company for their system that they built internally. And that was the innovation back then. Three to five years to build that. If you look at user specifications, building it, and user acceptance testing, it's, it's a pretty long trajectory for pharma. 
Then we realized Metadata, Oracle, ARISG, and Argus are good vendors. They figured it out. They were able to leverage technology to do it much more efficiently. So Pharma spent another two to three years customizing and uh, digitizing their work so that they could be used on those um, vendor platforms. Another two to four years rolls by and we realize CROs know how to do this. CROs have the technology. CROs have the manpower. Why not outsource it to CROs? So we have the Quintiles, the Icon, Covance, and PowerXL, and even from PV's perspective, we've got PV vendor CROs that are handling both the processing and hosting the technology. So this whole trajectory took us seven to 12 years, right? And only to realize that, well, you know what? We can outsource it to vendors who know what they're doing and who've invented the technology and who can do this much easier and faster than we are because we are pharma development companies, biotech development. We're not really high tech development. What's interesting is that in the last two to three years, we've gone to a public-private partnership model in which collaboration is key. We've got Transcelerate, Acre, CTTI, and we've heard a whole slew of them from um, Bob this morning about collaboration as the new way forward. So what does that mean for us? If we're looking at smart technology, if we're looking at smart glasses, we can see pharma trying to do this themselves, or we can see an opportunity for us to build together as a industry and collaborate. So I want to introduce this slide. This is the Rogers Innovation Adoption Curve as well as the pharma technology adoption curve. And if you look here, uh, where's my pointer? All right, oh, back. If we look here, we've got the typical um, innovators, early adopters, promoters, late adopters, and laggards. Typical for adoption, right? But if you look at the adoption curve from a corporate commitment perspective, we need the initial awareness the visioning, the prototyping, piloting, and adoption before the senior level commitment to building across the enterprise, right? So pharma traditionally lags behind all the other industries and in, in, um, committing to this enterprise level um, uh, technology deployment. So the value to this and onto the next few slides is really looking at if we want to see smart glasses if we want to see innovation in our lifetime, in the next five years when it's going to become mainstream, should we be starting now with awareness and visioning? Should we starting now with prototyping, right? Because it will become mainstream. It's here to stay, technology is here to stay. Three to five years ago, we couldn't imagine our life with, with a smartphone physically attached to us. Now it's no more than 100 feet from us at any given point. We can't live without it. So imagine in three to five years, pharma can't live without it. If we can't live without it, that means today we need to talk about visioning and prototyping. So this is Gartner's hype cycle for emerging technologies. And if you see on top in the green, that's the wearables. And wearables is in the peaked inflated expectation part of the curve, right? You've got the initial innovation trigger. You've got the peak of expectations. And when the hype is so high, everyone gets disillusioned and disappointed when there's no real application right away. And it takes time. It's not an immediate um, uh, development. Then there's a slope of enlightenment or learning about how we can adopt it and use it within our organizations until we get to plateau of productivity. So if you see today, a lot of the talks today was about black, uh, big data and cloud. Where is big data and cloud? This was a graph from August 2013, almost a year ago. Predictive analytics is on the right. You've got mobile and cloud computing here in the middle trying to get up to this plateau, right? So we're almost there, but in one year's time, look at how much we've progressed. Same with wearables. Wearables are on top of the hype right now. However, we can see that as these use cases start building momentum within the pharma companies, within healthcare and prototypes begin to be developed and you get further and further adoption, very easily between three to five years, we can see mainstream adoption across our enterprise. The barriers, certainly as I walk around the conference today, everyone wanted to try it, they all asked all kinds of questions. You know, from a technology perspective, yes, it, it does get a little hot with the batteries, so you don't want this to have, have it on all the time. 
the power, certainly they haven't figured out the power, but then iPhone, it's been 10, 20 years and uh, we still can't get it to last through the day. Um, we've got the management of the wireless and the per personal networks and security. So those are you know, technical um, challenges that everyone's facing. But there's also the societal, the social, the ethical, rather, is it cool to wear it, you know? I think in various environments, it is cool. Everyone wants to try it. In others, you feel uncomfortable feeling and looking like a geek having this computer on your head. Um, and in terms of privacy concerns, you know, going to a location where you could, with a wink of an eye, I can take a picture of all of you right now. With a wink of an eye, I can take a video of what's happening, you know, and certainly there's privacy concerns. But in a lab, when we're talking about lab animals, really what we're trying to do is expedite and facilitate the scientists so that they don't have to use their hands in a clean environment with their lab notebooks and with all the materials that they need, that they can actually physically talk to their glass and say, OK, glass, show me the lab notebook. OK, glass, show me last week's results. And very, very easily. Now, that's in the lab. What about in the clinical environment? One of the biggest areas where we're developing for pharma is really economizing on the um, effort it takes to qualify a site for clinical development. We send a CRO, CRA somewhere, ten, five, ten thousand dollars for travel expenses just to go there and ask the question of do they have a refrigerator, do they have drug storage, do they have uh, facilities to, commit, uh, to do the study. What's interesting is we ask um, these sites, you know, how many times have you been visited? Well, I've been visited by Pfizer five times today, two times yesterday by Merck, and one time tomorrow for, with Lilly, all asking the same questions. So that's an area where you can imagine someone at the site wearing this with an earpiece, you know, listening to your pharma representative saying, show me your facilities or give me a tour, and you can actually get all this information streamed through your Google Glass without having to fly anywhere, right? And it's live streaming, so there's nothing fake, and they can answer questions right away. And certainly with sales staff, the marketing and sales staff, you could get the information and retrieve it right away should your doctors and, and your key opinion leaders be asking you for information. So that's, the where, that's where we are today, and we're actually physically developing that today. And even from my headset, I can see my heart rate and ECG right uh, by command. So the question here is, if it's here today, and we have some minor tweaks to go through, what else do we need to say or do to get our companies to start adopting this and making it a reality and mainstream so that in 2020, it becomes a reality? So Forrester Research, predicts that 2014 is the year of the wearables. Last week, Apple announced HealthKit. What's important about HealthKit is that, very similar to my earlier slide, HealthKit is a platform. They built the platform and brought it out first for the developer to start developing applications on this platform because they know and they're <laughs> getting ready for the iWatch launch uh, later this year. So if you've got the iWatch tracking all of your uh, vital signs and to be able to provide you this information, they already have the platform ready to capture all this information. So if we look at today, 2014 to 2016, if we start piloting and having early adoption in healthcare, public health, and field workers during this period, 2017 to 19, we start mainstreaming and starting creating the back end, front end apps and services to allow for the enterprise level deployment. And remember that curve, it's gonna take a couple years before our enterprise level and your corporate commitment to enterprise deployment. It's with hope that if we start thinking about it and talking about it today and trying it today with prototyping, that in 2020, it will become a center of our business. Our world in 2020 will be quite different and that's really only five years away, not that far but wearables will be our mainstream. So thank you for your time and listening. And um, we have Jason next. Apple Health Kit? Apple Health Kit was announced um, uh, as a platform by Apple last week as part of their iOS um, that they're releasing later this year. And it allows for the development of new applications to capture vital signs data so your heartbeat, your sleep patterns, your breathing rate, your exercise rate, 
capture health records. So it's going to integrate with all your electronic health records and any other information out there that's being captured so that you have an integrated view of your health through this app. And it's a platform, it's a to, platform. to develop against to any of their devices? To allow for developers to develop apps. Right. For yeah. their devices. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And so it's the rumor today that the iWatch is coming out in the next few months to allow for the physical connection to your body or physical capture of this data. But they wanted to make sure that the platform was available for the developers first so that we can really start thinking about apps that we can develop when the iWatch comes out. Right. And just as a disclaimer, I have no stock in Google, <laughs> <Yeah>. Apple, <laughs> nor do I work with them. But we are, um, we've been selected as Google Partner of the Year, not from a contractual agreement, but more of how we work with companies to come up with new use cases and develop and design prototypes using what technology is available out there today, whether it's Google, Apple, or any of these um, technology experts that we have on the panel today. And that makes sense because what good is the hardware unless you have the software exactly. to run on it? Exactly. So to put that platform out first. It's smart, yes. Get that up and running. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay. All right. Thank you. Grace did a, a set of perfect segues for me, so thanks for doing that. Um, talked about the importance of software, which is great because we're a software company. Um, you know, I'm going to talk about smart glasses and the enterprise, and uh, you'll have to excuse the fact that I'm going to to approach this from more of a, a broad kind of a multiple industry type of a, a perspective because what I'm trying to emphasize at the end of this is the importance of a, a, a software f platform or a framework that really goes uh, horizontal across multiple industries and multiple use cases. So obviously there are, there are many different applications in, in pharma and healthcare um, and then you know probably a hundred or even a thousand different use cases using wearables in those kinds, types of instances. And I'll, I'll kind of talk through the, the state of the art in, or, in a world according to us who's been living and breathing wearables for the last four years and uh, give an outlook into that. Um, you know, glasses really boil down to uh, a couple of different uh, key type of characteristics. And sorry about the, the blue font. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a head-worn device uh, with a display. And while Google Glass is the, the best kind of a known form factor for it. There are other kinds of form factors that exist containing, you know, in view, out of view, um, you know, opaque displays and transparent displays. And they, they all have uh, their advantages and disadvantages and it really ends up being a trade-off. Um, but, you know, the key takeaway is that you've got, they break out into, you know, the type or the, the placement of the different lenses. Um, and then, of course, it's got some sort of sensors that are built into the headset. Uh, you know, two of the most common ones is the, the, the motion tracking or an orientation sensor of a sort. So your accelerometer, gyroscope, and uh, a compass uh, to be able to track the user's head movement. And, of course, uh, the other sensor, which has been quite controversial for glass, is the camera. Um, and then and the, the takeaway for the, the contextual sensors is that there has to be some sort of a machine level knowledge in, in order for the, the wearable computers to be really powerful uh, for the, the software, for example, to understand what the user is looking at, what the user is listening to, and potentially what the orientation or the, the movement of the user is. And it's one of the baselines that the software effectively requires for glasses of any kind to to, to have, and then of course it has to be connected to the network. Um, some some uh, devices, for example, like uh, Google Glass or even the Epson Bavario, uh, have a built-in processor to be able to at least pre-process some of that data and following effectively a hybrid processing model where some of the processing is done local to the device and then you know a lot of it also is done on the cloud using, for example, voice. Um, you know, the, Google relies on their, their cloud-based uh, speech engine to be able to do text-speech uh, translations, for example, whereas the, the typical well-known OK Glass command is processed locally. 
Um, but there are some glasses, particularly from people, uh, the, a bunch of startup companies that are, that are kind of all over the, the world coming out and announcing uh, product plans for glasses that are in the sub $200 range that doesn't contain any kind of a, a processor at all. So it's kind of interesting to see how even within the glasses market, you have a, rather than having a convergence towards a single form factor, um, you have a lot of companies that are actually diverging into multiple different feature sets and form factors. And uh, the reason why people do that, we think, is because wearable devices are intimate by nature. And um, you know, with that, that kind of an intimacy, one device does not fit all to all the different use cases and the, and the applications and people. So these are some of the examples of uh, the different form factors that are actually available out in the market today. Um, you know, on the, the top left side, you've got what's uh, the Epson Moverio BT200, uh, which was announced at CES this year and uh, just recently became generally available worldwide, is a, a full see-through, over-the-eye kinds of uh, heads-up display. So if you're familiar with the whole notion of uh, an augmented reality type of a glasses, that's, that's the closest uh, that you'll get to today in that it's got two displays that are fully transparent that go over your eyes, which means that it's actually capable of, uh, in theory, it's, uh, it's capable of doing a, a full 3D overlay content on top of the real world. Unfortunately, the reality is that, you know, with the camera and the algorithms that are out there, doing an exact registration of augmented reality is very, very difficult today. Um, and then you've got, to the right, uh, you've got the, the see-through, out-of-view, heads-up display, which is, you know, Google Glass, which Grace and I are wearing, where the, the experience is more like uh, holding, holding your smartphone kind of at an arm's length out-of-view and then in the upper right quadrant of uh, your vision. So you're still getting access to, to content in a heads-up and, uh, in most cases, a hands-free fashion, but it's not going over your eyes. And, there isn't any kind of an overlay that you can put on top of the real world. Uh, as a result of that, the effective canvas that you can draw from a software developer is much, much smaller. And then you've got the, the opaque out of view heads up displays where to the left is actually a product that, uh, that has been uh, demoed, but unfortunately is not generally available today. And that's the, the Recon Jet. And that's actually geared uh, largely towards the, the, the consumer market of, for example, cycling. Um, you know, it's a uh, Recon's the company that made the, the ski goggles with a built in display that's out of view. And it's the same technology that's integrated into a nice, sleek looking uh, set of uh, sunglasses. And um, it's meant to pair to your phone to give you vital data. Um, a good candidate, for example, for HealthKit for iOS. Um, so, so, Jay, what is it? The cycle? This is big for cyclists? Yeah. Uh, so that's, what's the use case? That, what are they, they're looking at what? What they're passing? It's telling them what they're... It can certainly do that. It could also integrate with, uh, I'll, I'll be speculative and say with an iWatch or some sort of a, a wearable type of a biosensor and give you that data heads up. And they could see like their heart rate or... Right. Wow, perfect. Uh, distance traveled if you're cycling. Yeah. You know, all, all kinds of interesting information that that, that effectively gamifies whatever it is that you're doing. And cycling is just a really good example of that. Uh, and I know that um, they've had just a tremendous amount of uh, market take up, particularly in the cycling industry, because people wear glasses there anyway. Um, and that, that, by the way, is a parallel that you'll see in the enterprise anyway, um, as well, in that a lot of the industries that where we, as a, as a technology provider in the wearable space, has gotten a lot of traction in tends to be in industries where there is a uniform or you know, some other kind of equipment that is being expected to, to be worn. So in a pharma environment, that could be a lab coat, or in a healthcare environment, that could be a stethoscope, where um, you know, there's, there's less of an aversion towards having a piece of equipment that you bring to work or that you use in a, in a workplace setting on a day-in and day-out basis. Yeah, but I, I'm a, any runners out there? I'm a runner, and I can, I can certainly see use, you know, transposing from cycling to running because I've been lost, and it would be great to know where I am to get back to where I want to go or being able to see the speed I'm going or the heart rate or, or even you know, how much elevation change I've had. Yeah. So that's really exciting to know. No, no question about it. Right? Recon jet. Um, you know, 
Okay. Don't own any stock in the company, but it's it's a nice product. It's, uh, <laughs> they were they were actually demonstrating their product at uh, at Google's uh, developer conference last year. So um, you know people. So the Jet, for example, runs on a um, on its own proprietary system, uh, operating system with an SDK support to handheld in iOS and uh, Android. Um, every single one of the other devices runs some sort of a variant of Android. The middle one at the bottom there, I don't know what the laser pointer is. Okay, that one right there is the Vizix M100, and that you know that they. Uh, it's it's most commonly known as a, an industry specific type of a, a smart glass product, and Vizix is a very well known company in the in the business. Um, and you know that that right there is a thousand dollars today, generally available, runs Android. And then to the right of it is kind of the the most ghastly, I think, uh, type of a device, and that's called the Copen Golden Eye. Um, you know, targeted towards like super industrial uh, type of a use case where. Yeah, it's uh, it's for for what it is, it is actually surprisingly comfortable. Um, but just looking at a picture of it actually doesn't do it quite the justice. Uh, but you know, it's also the display portion of it is right there at the bottom, and it's a, a boom and kind of an out of view uh, heads up display. Um, pricing wise, uh, the Moverio is at seven hundred dollars. Glass is, glass still obviously is at uh, fifteen hundred dollars. Um, the jet, I believe, is sitting at the six to seven hundred dollar type of uh, a price point, and then the M100, a thousand, and then the Golden Eye, I think, is a, a couple of thousand, depending on the options that you take on. So, at least from the in industry perspective, it's actually great from my perspective because I got my start um, building software for the military pair of glasses that easily ran about thirty to thirty-five thousand dollars a set, and that's what the the government had to pay. And obviously, um, it goes on without saying that the system didn't get the, the deployment out into 100,000 devices as, as we were hoping for. Um, but yeah, there, there has been a drastic reduction in pricing even over the last two years of, uh, of glasses and other kinds of, you know, uh, what, I, what I'll call foundational technology that's out there. And whether or not that's the, the lens or that's the, the display or what have you, uh, there has been an order of magnitude in reduction, and sometimes, uh, in some cases, more um, in in price reduction. So it's reasonable to assume that projecting out the next uh, 12 to 24 months, that you'll see you'll see the price of glasses uh, get into what what we think is going to be the magic price point for really uh, a widespread scalability, and that's that's right at the $500 mark. I, I won't harp on the advantages so much, but you know, it's glasses in, in many kind of a way, assuming that we've hit the right kind of a, a price point, is really an ideal user device in, in a world where there's just lots and lots of data. And it's because you can, you can access all of the data that you need in a heads up and in a, in a hands free type of a fashion. So companies, uh, for example, will spend millions and in certain cases billions of dollars over you know, tens of years. To, to build up slowly their, their kind of an enterprise IT backbone and all of the database uh, associated with that. And if you were trying to use glasses as a, a, a browser into all of that data, then you've now got something that's extremely powerful in that you've got a bunch of boring computer machines sitting in your data room uh, all the way out into the lab environment and a field environment, and you're getting that data right in your vision. Um, it fundamentally changes how people access and interact with uh, data today. Um, and then, you know, of course, uh, glasses being a, a sensor that's, that's worn in a, in a part of the body that has the most amount of sensors from a human perspective, it in turn can also glean the, the best kind of uh, contextual awareness as to what it is that you're doing. And that kind of, uh, that actually is a, a data feed back into uh, the big data where you, you can now get some, uh, somewhat scary by the way, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, contextual awareness as to how efficient your workforce is or where, you are, where your workforce is spending the most amount of their time, uh, what they're doing the most, and try and see if you can gain some efficiencies based on the, um, you know, the human body effectively acting as a sensor. And really, glasses are ideal for workers, and uh, we, we call them actually deskless workers. So there are, there are large companies, uh, 
pharma being one and healthcare being the other, uh, oil and gas and energy and manufacturing and logistics being some of the other kind of industry examples that are out there um, where the majority of the workforce is not normally confined to a desk where they have access to a computer, they have access to a phone. So in those types of instances, if you think about uh, smart glasses in a consumer setting like uh, what Grace and I are wearing for, for glasses, really from a consumer's perspective, glass is acting as a second screen to uh, your mobile phone or to, to your computer. To, you know, you're never using that screen as your principal method of communicating, at least how the, the user experience uh, paradigms are set today. And that's because we've already, we, we always have our smartphones to kind of fall back on to be able to type and do all kinds of other things. Uh, in an enterprise setting where a lot of the workforce may not ordinarily be issued a, a smartphone of their own, or in, in certain cases not be permitted to use their smartphones, which is a, a trend that fortunately is changing, you're now dealing with a user experience scenario where glasses are now your, your first and only screen that you're using. And the kinds of use cases that you have to deliver against that actually is fundamentally different from some of the consumer use cases. And that's very important. Some of the applications, um, which you know, I, I've got just a quick video that was actually shown most recently last week at a SAP's conference called Sapphire as a part of the keynote in uh, using glasses in, in a workplace that we supported. But you're, you're looking at as far as the applications of glasses go, you're actually surprisingly looking at fairly boring things. Uh, you're looking at being able to manage and you know, step through tasks uh, and, and having instruction videos for uh, you know, chemical reaction or going through standard operating procedures, uh, going through MSDS. That kind of boring stuff is actually incredibly valuable from a safety perspective. Uh, you also have a, a, telecons a teleconsultation and a telepresence, which obviously is a use case that uh, that, that Grace touched on uh, pretty heavily. But within the enterprise context, you can't necessarily rely on the vendor provided services. For, for example, Google until recently provided Hangouts, which is uh, you know, their, their telepresence type of a system on glass. Um, most companies don't use Google as a backbone. And in fact, we'll have specific IT policies that will say that we have to use our, our own kind of hosted or approved services. So from an enterprise technology vendor's perspective, there's actually value in being able to take that kind of a, take that kind of a technology and actually replicate that in the enterprise space uh, under a service that at least they feel more comfortable controlling. Um, Real-time visualization of data, that one's kind of an obvious one. Uh, you know, I used the, the big data example for that. Inventory management is where we also have gotten a, a big, uh, a lot of traction where almost every large company uh, that has a, a, some sort of a manufacturing or stocking type of an operation, wherever you're moving goods, um, there, is, there is just a, that's the perfect kind of a hands-free scenario, using that as an example, because people carry barcode holders, and they constantly have to use their hands to either push a cart or carry objects. What if you can try and bring that data in a heads-up in a hands-free fashion? Um, I, I almost uh, didn't put in the last bullet, and some of the panelists here actually, and, and I talked about it, but you actually can do a little bit of a, a limited augmented reality type of an application, with the caveat being that it won't be the, the sci-fi type of an augmented reality where you have an overlay that's directly over, for example, if I'm looking at that bottle, I'm not gonna be able to see the outlines of that bottle using my glasses. But uh, there are certain interesting uh, imaging algorithms that exist out there that can, that can detect that object. And that in trigger that 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 in a, in turn can trigger a, a sequence of actions or videos that are not necessarily direct overlays, um, but can give you interactive, uh, contextually relevant data, which is one of the the founding principles of augmented reality. And I think this is our video. Can you help me uh, hit play on that, please? So, uh, for, like I said, for, for background, this was the, the video that was shown at uh, SAP. Smart glasses. In this video, I'm going to show you how Skylight provides the human experience for the industrial internet. We will also show how Skylight uses SAP's HANA to uniquely deliver real-time, hands-free, mobile operations. We are at an inflection point of empowering people to do great work. 
by connecting them together and to the immense new sources of data out in the real world. In this video, you're going to see the perspective of a field technician working on an absolutely mission critical piece of equipment. This will deliver all of the power of the enterprise and all of its data right to the most essential point, right where the person is getting work done. Here, you can see what it looks like looking through a pair of smart glasses. He is getting feedback about performance today and some information about the world around him. Based on data SAP's HANA is processing and the user context we are sending it, a predictive alert is created. We show that where the task is to be performed and a beacon shows up giving directions to where this activity needs to take place. Here the technician opens up a skylight menu corresponding to this particular machine. I'm doing all of this hands-free just by looking at it. Any networked device, equipment, or application, I can interact like this. My first investigation will be to pull out of HANA diagnostic or reference data streaming from the machine or information aggregated and processed from any source. We can show multiple simultaneous feeds if we wanted to do so. Now the technician pulls up the information he needs to perform the task. In this case, it is an animated model of the part stored in SAP's visual enterprise. The power of providing reference information, best practices, and contextual guides all hands-free is a game changer for any repair, installation, configuration, training, or QA task in the enterprise. The technician always has a menu of Skylight actions they can take. Here, the technician has some questions, and he's going to initiate a video call with a remote expert. That's my boss. The remote expert can see what the technician sees and provide immediate expert help right where the work is getting done. The expert can even provide direct guidance by telestrating right on top of the user's field of view. This is a unique and powerful capability. The technician not only has all the data they need, but access to every expert in the company, all hands-free and in real time. Now that this task is done, the technician moves on with the rest of the work for his day. Of course, this is just one small example of the power of delivering real-time, hands-free information using Skylight and SAP's HANA right to where the work is getting done. For more information, please visit us at www.apx-labs.com. Thank you. Jay, this would be great for all the, all the clumsy guys that come in and fix my refrigerator or whatever it is, and I can't do it. I don't know what this model is, and I end up leaving, and I've been waiting all day for them to come. Yeah, at field service and repair is one of the, the, the industries where we had one of our, our first pilot cases uh, working for, you know, working with a, a Fortune 100 type of uh, a manufacturer of these devices and therefore have to support uh, the product at the end of it. Uh, but you can kind of see where, where some of these things are going. And by the way, all of, all of what you saw there, and this is, the, uh, this is the part that kind of puts all into context, Every single feature that you saw there actually exists in real life, and that was a demo that we did shooting behind uh, um, a, a pair of Epson Moverios with a, a camcorder behind it. That's why some of the media uh, kind of, some of the movement uh, with some of the, the pan and tilt was kind of jarred because it, it literally was a glasses with a camcorder on a <laughs> tripod. Someone was trying to navigate in, a, you know, in front of a machine. Um, so the technology is actually much closer than, than you think and certainly is ready to, to get into all kinds of different pilot instances and for scaling you know, a year or two um, from now. Uh, and we're targeting, we're, we as an industry are targeting uh, the deskless workers, which uh, at least in the U.S. is uh, one in every 10 person. These go through some of the use cases that are, that are being uh, you know, actively discussed today. Uh, healthcare and pharma obviously is the, one of the leading industry in manufacturing, logistics, energy, utilities. Um, government, which is again where we came out of, where even in uh, 2011 we had, done a, we had done a project with the Army Medical Command in equipping field medics with glasses and having real-time data pop up in the, in the field there as well. But you know, to the right of it is where you get um, your return on investment because no company is going to invest in a piece of technology if it doesn't gain some, something tangible back. And 
And uh, a big portion of what we play is, you know, the efficiency game. So can you use glasses and can you use wearable tech more broadly to, to be able to, you know, speed up your processes? Uh, does it enable you to use uh, perhaps a less skilled person to be able to do the job because you've always got access to someone who's remote, um, who's able to help you uh, off-site? You know, does it improve quality, especially in a manufacturing type of an environment? Does it improve safety, which is a, a massive, you know, if you, if you go, and if you're thinking about quite literally the act of saving lives, then, you know, the return on investment all of a sudden looks very, very good. And uh, something that I, that I infer to is that can you use glasses and other kinds of wearable device users as sensors to feed back into your ERP systems where you can gain new insights on uh, how your business operations are actually being performed. Um, you know, this, this goes over, I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to just really quickly go over this and skip the slide, is that the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that a single business, because a single business has, as I said, a hundred or so different use cases, um, you know, they're going to want to different, uh, deploy different kinds of sets of tools and sets of glasses, even the ones with the, the silly kind of a headset. Uh, you know, in heavy manufacturing scenarios or even in instances where you have to wear a helmet, having a device like that that's a little bit more rugged than your Google Glass or your the Epson Moverios may actually be very, very helpful. So there is, uh, just like in, in any kind of uh, an industry where you're using a tool, there is such a thing as the right tool for the right job. So we, you know, while we're very bullish on Google Glass and other kinds of platforms that are out there today, we also believe that some of the other emerging uh, hardware platforms that are, that are around the corner are going to have a place in, uh, in deployment in the workplace. Uh, Skylight's our product, and Skylight's our, our software product that actually, you know, is a, a framework and a platform upon which different applications can be built. Uh, but even perhaps more importantly, what it serves as is the, the connector to a lot of the, the big data investments and uh, ERPs and enterprise IT infrastructure um, that companies have spent a lot of money trying to build out and trying to bring all of that data back and forth to the user using wearables as the, the first class citizen. Uh, and more importantly, uh, even, even more so than that, it connects across multiple types of mobile devices uh, multiple types of glasses, including Google Glass and Moverio, and we're the only platform that's out there that actually um, integrates it into a, a single kind of a unified framework today, uh, supporting more than just the glass or more than the, the Moverio. We, and we also encompass uh, other wearable devices like smart bands and smart watches as well, uh, working in conjunction with the phone. So uh, it really is a, a full kind of a, an enterprise mobile framework. And rather than giving away Tim's uh, first set of slides, I'll okay, introduce Tim. Knock yeah. <laughs> yourself out. But thanks, thank you. Thanks very much. I'm, I'm Tim Colbago from Image IQ. Um, first of all, I want to explain something that's very important for everyone who's watching. Uh, it is required that everybody on the panel wear some form of Google Glass product. I'm wearing an early version of Google contact lenses at this point in time, just so we're clear, because Grace and Jay were like, oh. I wanted to start out my, my question with, I, I am also wearing the Google underwear, but that's a little, that's for later in the show. Um, for, I want, Anybody BlackBerry, old BlackBerry users? Who used to have BlackBerry? Anybody BlackBerry? So what was your reaction after the, when the BlackBerry came out? And you, then you saw the iPhone. What was the first thing you said? I, if it was me, I went, where's the keyboard? <laughs> right? Right? It was like, where's the keyboard? This is unbelievable. I can't possibly have a cell phone without a keyboard. This, is, I mean, this will never work. That was my first reaction. I got my iPhone. I'm an iPhone addict now, right? And that was your first reaction when, Black, when iPhone came out. Where's the keyboard? So Image IQ is, uh, what we do is we spend our day writing software to analyze images. And for most of you, it's stuff that happens in your preclinical work or your clinical trial work, right? Why are we interested in glass? Well, the interesting question about glass is, there's no place to put a keyboard anymore, right? So it's, it, we went from BlackBerry to iPhone, where's the keyboard, to glass where there's no place to put the keyboard, right? I mean, it's kind of weird that way. So the question around how image analysis works with glass is really interesting to us. And really, 
when you think about it, the glass has two main interfaces or any kind of wearable, right? You've got your image and video, as Jay pointed out, a little controversial, like, like you're not going to be going to the casino tonight with those, right? Wearing those because they've been banned in the casinos, right? For card count, there's a card counting app. I'm pretty sure a blackjack card counting app. <laughs> pretty cool idea. I wish I would have thought of that one. Uh, <laughs> that, and voice, right? And you talk to it. Now, we're probably all getting into the Siri thing and we're getting used to voice, but that's kind of the main glass interface. What we're interested in is understanding not that augmented reality thing, but how can we write software to analyze images using glass as an acquisition platform or any kind of wearable device as an acquisition platform? And what can be done today about that, right? The goal of this panel is to inspire you to think about what can be done. Where are we going? If you look at Grace's curves, right? Like, well, here we are, and we know where we're going to end up, right? I mean, everybody, we've seen that. That movie's going to play out exactly how it is. And the way that movie plays out is smart people like you all who are staying here late at night, and, you know, I've only got about 50 slides, so we'll be <laughs> out of here real soon. Uh, but smart people like you trying to figure out, well, how does that work? What can I use this for? And so what I'm here to do is introduce how image analysis software can be a pretty powerful concept. So what can be done today, right? That's, it's a kind of an interesting question. You know, what's possible, and, and David and I just talked about this before the, before the panel, is standard coding things work really well with glass, right? If you put QR codes on something or you put a snowflake or a barcode, man, you are cooking. I, when I first got my glass, and, and strangely enough, I do have them with me. I'm just not wearing them. Uh, but <laughs> ours are Image IQ orange. They're really sharp, right? They're the second generation, which is pretty neat. And when I went to set up my Wi-Fi, what do they do? They, you go on your phone. It says here, to put your Wi-Fi on your phone, and it shows you a QR code, a whole lot like that. And it, and it sets up your Wi-Fi and your glass for you. How cool is that? Works awesome. Works wonderfully. It works really well in those controlled environments where you've got an office or a lab. But now David's talking about people who are working in the pharmaceutical industry who are potentially working with hundreds or thousands of compounds every day who don't want to put barcodes on these things. Right. Right? Who don't want to? Who don't want to label? Them. Well, that's an expense, and boy, you put the wrong barcode on the wrong thing, and now you got a source of error, and then the quality people go nuts, and it just get, the whole thing falls apart. Right. So how can you use software to analyze what you're looking at in glass? And that's what we think is interesting, right? That's what we think is interesting. You know, Jay pointed out the example of, well, I can look at that bottle of water, and I'm not going to get an augmented reality view of that, right? I'm not going to see the edges of the water or anything. That, but, what, but what we have started producing is software that can look at that, recognize it as a bottle of water, potentially recognize how big it is, what brand it is, Right? And tell you how many calories, okay, it's water, that doesn't count. <laughs> okay, well, pretend it was something, not water. And, and how many calories are in it, right? Where it came from, what lot number was it, uh, how old is it, has it expired? And we can start answering those kinds of questions through straight software analysis, right? You don't have to talk to it, you just have to take the picture. That's the idea. And that's the challenge for all of you, right? Is you, you know what you're doing every day and where there's inefficiencies and questions that you want to have answered. And you're sitting here going, there is no way in God's green earth that thing that Grace is wearing is going to be able to figure that out. And our argument would be, yes, it will. Right? It may not be tomorrow, but it will. And that's really what we're looking at. So what's possible today is pretty cool, right? If you have controlled environments and you have warehouse, where we think it's going is um, in, some, in some of those environments, but there are some challenges. Right? This is actually a glass app we built, uh, a screenshot. It's really pretty poor. Um, but we were actually doing some uh, agricultural work and doing, taking pictures of grass and telling you uh, nitrogen content. Kind of a neat trick. Uh, and that was a really neat idea in terms of using a wearable device. But, but where, is, where are we going to have challenges with glass? Well, I'll tell you right now, we took this thing out to, this happens to be a golf course. See a little golf flag up there? Uh, yeah, you couldn't see it. <laughs> right, bright outdoor light for certain platforms are going to be a challenge. We need to get that feedback back to the manufacturers so that they understand where we can and can't use them because there are outdoor applications, right? Freeform recognition is really hard, right? So for me to sit here and build an app that says, hey, tell me about the, the auditorium here. How many chairs are full? How many aren't? Right? We do that with cell counts all the time. How many cells are transfection, transfected? How many aren't? Right, to build a freeform app to just do that and kind of the Iron Man thing. Have you seen the Iron Man movie? You know, he's waving, waving all this. Not going to happen. <laughs> right? he's just, that's a hard problem, as they say. Terminator, we could probably do because that was older and it was Schwarzenegger. So, it was good. Um, so that's pretty neat. The other thing that, that, that we find really challenging in glass and, and the work we've done is high volume content. Right? So when people are trying to rip through things, we had a conversation about, you know, for example, one of the things I spent my, my, a lot of my time in the radiology space, right? And radiologists today, especially under um, a healthcare system that's under a lot of pressure for quality and cost, right? Radiology is about efficiency and accuracy. Glass is not it. 
and it won't be, right? There are going to be places where it fits and places where it doesn't. And again, we're trying to be a little provocative here and think about, well, what, what works for you? And, and as you start thinking about that, you're going to all help push us around down Grace's curves, right? And you're going to help us get to that point where we go, hey, it will work here. This is the right tool for the right job in the right place. And that's really exciting. And we think you put the right software in, that in place relative to some image analysis, and you can do some pretty cool stuff. So that's kind of the idea, that we think image analysis software is pretty core to this glass platform. Otherwise, all you've really done is taking your cell phone and strapped it to the side of your head, right? If, if, if you get something that can actually start recognizing the environment around you and recognizing the bottle of water or whatever it might be, or compounds in a dish <laughs> or something like that, it can become a pretty powerful place to be. So kind of exciting. I think that's, I mean, uh, actually, this is, I think, the end of my slide. So really, it wasn't 50 slides. But, you know, the challenge to all of you is where will it fit? Right? Where, where will it fit? And, and how can you use it in your day-to-day -day work where you're trying to develop interesting applications and trying to understand your biology and your pharmacological, pharmacological stuff? And, and I don't know, right? And that's, that's what's exciting for us is to try to figure that out from you and, and hear what your thoughts are. So that's the short version of the story. And I don't really have the contacts in, but someday <laughs> maybe we'll have them, right? So Don, I think you're up, right? Great. So thanks very much for uh, inviting Spritz here. And what, what is Spritz all about? Spritz started thinking about small screens and, inc or, and how incongruent they are as a presentation of text. No new reading technology exists for the vast array of, mo of digital formats. And they came up with a technology to stream text one word at a time which they envision as a game changer in the digital space requirement for reading. So if you think about, uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm not. Uh... Start thinking of wearables and mobile uh, devices and thinking of new use cases, new requirements, and new degrees of freedom. Why imitate former uh, platforms with new reading uh, uh, technologies? So they devised a text streaming technology that integrates into modern communications, it enables smaller devices and wearables to um, deliver content uh, in, embedded in applications through a SDK that's been uh, delivered to, for web, iOS, and Android, enabling both public and private integration of services. Um, the technology takes 13 characters at a glance, captures specific positioning of optical recognition uh, placement, and dwells in terms of reading times from a speed of 250 characters per minute to 500 words per minute, excuse me. The right um, speed for reading is important for comprehension. So the technology is text streaming optimized for dense representation. What is the impact of this? The, the company sees this as a game-changing technology for content providers and end users. It facilitates fast reading in must-read contents, efficient reading on wearables, text integration into pictures, maps, and augmented reality, and new degrees of freedom for user interfaces. So spritz on glass with one eye through, uh, with an application into multiple industries, including the medical industry full con deliver, content delivered, cross <coughs> devices. I'm actually not sure. I'm sorry, I wanted to go back to the previous screen. To, um, and actually to, to start the video and the adverse effect to profile what the spritzing capability would look like for you. So imagine that being delivered through the glass, through the tablet, omnipresence communications in real time as you're in this case, in a surgical room or, or dealing with a patient in real time. So this is the case history that's being delivered to the physician as we speak. You notice that it focuses your eye in that Donna, one. Donna, Sorry. what are the red letters? What's the significance of the red? So that is a um, optical recognition point that uh, as you're reading, one of the reasons you can't consume content as rapidly as you may in this process is that your eye has to move from left to right and it engages your brain at a different level. This focuses your uh, concentration on the um, highest inference point for the word that you're receiving at that point in time. This one is using visual feedback, so I'm red, green, colorblind. 
I don't even see that drug at all. So oh, so that's uh, great feedback. What yeah. people do when they want to be able to differentiate for people who are like that, they use blue and yellow because they okay. can, they'll see those as very high contrast of things. That's very helpful. Thank you very much for that. Uh, yes, it can stream to voice as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the value proposition here is quick content, uh, content delivered quickly, focused reading on the go for casual or emergency situations, maximizes the information that can be presented in a compact format, and tracking what's read to um, profile both comprehension as well as compliance in multiple industries that may be looking to uh, answer compliance or efficacy questions. So thank you very much for letting us give you a broad overview of this technology. Please feel free to check us out on Facebook, on Twitter, or look through our science and frequently asked questions. would welcome any feedback relative to um, reception of the technology. Thank you. I just want to make a comment here, and, and I thank you both, and, and Jay as well, for your presentations. But if you imagine the panel and the technology that's sitting here, that as an example, we could just totally disrupt the EDC technology and industry. Imagine if you can take the entire patient records and conduct the entire clinical trial through your glasses. It tells you what form or what questions you need to ask your, your patients, and it reads the questionnaires that your patients are going through, measures the movement, whether it's the flexibility of the foot or rheumatoid arthritis or anything that can be captured and measured through your glass. In five years, we could conduct the entire clinical trial through a virtual environment. And, and more importantly, and, and additionally interesting, not more importantly, yeah. but, but you now have a platform where you can prove compliance. Yes. Because how much money do you all spend sitting there trying to prove to somebody that you did something, yeah. right? The docu you know, it doesn't count, it, you know, it doesn't, you didn't do it if you don't turn in the homework, mm -hmm. right? Now you're, turn you're creating the homework just by right. doing the work, right? And that's a, that's a very powerful platform to, right. to make Any that kind happen. of documentation of anything. Yeah. I mean, yes. in this industry, we spent a lot of money on documenting things. Yeah. That's, that's right. We document everything. Mm -hmm. So I have a question. So we had web cameras and smartphone cameras and uh, laptop cameras for probably five years now. And so a lot of the arguments that I've heard you make, some of them are, are specific to laptops, but a lot of them that first slide follow deck again? those same technologies yeah, like Show me your refrigerator, show me this. It's a little bit cumbersome, but I can do that all on my phone. Why hasn't that caught on, and why will Glass change it and actually make it catch on? What's the difference? It's the interactivity and the streaming, right? So yes, you can stream FaceTime through a tour, right. but if I were on the other end of that and said, is that measurement right? I can't measure that using a FaceTime. Whereas if you have imagery processing or text processing capabilities, that can process whether that is regulation size. Well, why right? is that on the phone? I wonder that for all the app developers out there. Yeah, it can, it can be on the phone. You know, and I think it's, it's funny that you say this because when I took, um, when we first got our first pair of glass a while back and we took it to our developers, they were like, well, like this can do everything, of, I can do everything on here that a phone can do. I mean, that was the initial reaction. and and. And, you know, on the surface, I think that's, that's a very accurate statement. The question is, is, does the form factor change the adoption curve, right? right. I, I think that's really what it comes down to, right? Okay. Is, is that, hey, now I'm where, I, you know, I don't have to do any, you heard Jay say this, you know, it, it, for environments where you don't have to use your, where your, your hands are busy, yeah. right. this, this starts to work. Right, sure. as opposed to man, I gotta pull out my phone and I gotta do yeah. this. And that. But yeah, but 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 I'm just I'm just saying like yeah. you want to use these other cases because you're 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 making the speculation that hey, this is gonna change the game. Now we can do blah blah blah. But but in reality, we could be doing blah blah blah. Why aren't we? Right? You, yeah, so. you you could be you could be. I think the challenge is you know it comes out what Jay you said it right. It comes down to efficiency and accuracy. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Can yeah. you do something more accurately or more efficiently? Mm -hmm. And the question is. I, if I'm sitting here today and I'm processing something on the line and I want to QA, I mean, let's QA your manufacturing process where you're putting pills down the line and you want to QA that manufacturing, to grab your phone and to do this <laughs> isn't going to happen. But if it's happening real time while you're doing some other job, it's an enabler, right? So, and again, I, I'm not sure we have all yeah. the answers, but we have those kind of... Well, that's the thing. I mean, I'm just, I'm just thinking about maybe there... I don't know what they are, but maybe there's other adoptions to bar yeah. uh, barriers to, to adoption than just... 
I don't have to hold it anymore. Right. I don't know what they no, are. No, but it's also the perspective. So if you look at independent monitoring boards, you know, they want to know that the PI has evaluated this patient and seen the same thing that they would have seen. Okay. So having something at a different angle than what the PI would have seen actually has a slight difference. So you could actually talk about validation of a device that is not completely in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. And literally now we're talking about the eye of the beholder right. in this case where he's now controlling it. Okay. So there's a nuance to the validation process. And, and the other question I had is do you see um, this taking over the role of the phone? Um, and I mean, you talk about the, the, the processing capability of a phone and it's not quite there with the glass yet, but do you see the time where you don't need to make phone calls through your phone, you can just say, Hey, call my mom. You know. I mean, they're they're already doing that today, yeah. right? The glass glass users are doing that. Well, yeah, through the phone, right? But is I, that right? Or a, no? As an example, we support you know full voice over IP calling. Okay. And uh, it, using and, glasses and it does to the device. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm connected to the convention Wi-Fi right now, okay. so I can post to have a Google Hangout right over my glass. Okay. Yeah. And and to another way to answer your question, I think is it really comes down to the ease of access of a screen and uh, all of the sensors that you've got at your disposal. Mm -hmm. While you can pull out your phone and do, I would argue, 99% of the things that you ordinarily would be able to do with glass, um, you, can't, you can't undercut or discount the fact that uh, glass and other kinds of wearable devices offer you a layer of accessibility that's much, much, much better than a phone. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we're developing that right now. So yeah. it's built into the Google uh, the goggles. Yeah. Yeah. And the other question is, uh, both of use cases tend to be, at least from today's panel, tend to be in enterprise environment. What does it you know, prevent this from getting into the consumer section? In terms of uses? Yeah. Do you see that this is going to be get utilized in enterprise environment first? then get into the consumer session. No, it'll go Plus consumer first, around. yeah. Yeah, but if you look at now, we're in the age of VYOD, right, in, in enterprise, in the companies. VYOD, I mean, we've had iPhones for now eight, 10 years. We could have had that a while ago, but it's the cultural perception. That's why the first slides I was presenting, that whole thing is about human nature, about accepting change and accepting innovation. We could have this across the enterprise today. I mean, there's no limitations to stopping us other than human resistance to change, right? Could we talk about the ugly side a little bit? You would mentioned earlier, I could take videotape of everything. There would be some security issues. I like the way yeah. you handled that. <laughs> um, but let's address that. Um, I would imagine that there are some ways in which the security issues are similar to any other IT situation, okay? But um, is there is there built into the design? Like Jay, since you're the hands-on guy for for the things that you've done, the are you building in as if you've got a sensor that a sensor that where the data is going, that it's going somewhere, right? You could buy you could buy a pair of glasses. It could already be set up to take whatever data it wants to collect about you, right, and yep. make something happen with it. Is there some kind of a safeguard within the industry that's starting to be developed, or is it just kind of, eh, we know, we know there are going to be problems and, you know, we're just going to go forward? No, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of authentication, just even in the healthcare space with respect to HIPAA and, um, you know, some of the interface protocols that you have to follow if, you're, if you are to move uh, personally identifiable information across the network. So there are, there are standards that you have to follow as a, as a baseline. And then, you know, there's also authentication issues with users being able to just pick up a, a, a glass set that, you know, may have been just left out and then put it on and all of a sudden you've got access to a lot of the, the information that was out there. So, you know, some of the, a lot of the stuff that we have had to, to worry about in building out a platform for the enterprise has been um, sweating out some of the boring stuff, like you know, what's the what's the right kind of timing to be able to lock out your device? Um, you know, what what kind of uh, an authentication scheme do you have to follow in order for you to to be compliant against uh, some of the data security schemes? What kind of sensors do you have to pull in? Um, we we as a company have done a lot with uh, Bluetooth low energy beacons, for example. And one of the the dumber cases that's been actually somewhat amusing is. 
Um, we put one of those sensors in a bathroom. <laughs> And the second that you become within the range of that bathroom, the system shuts the camera off. You know, it's, it, it seems completely silly, but um, that, you know, that kind of an indoor presence and uh, location and using that data to, to deliberately uh, manipulate some of the, the data that you would otherwise have access to are, are kinds of key problems to solve within the industry for sure. Yeah, but I mean, you have to think about today's world, right? What's to stop anybody from walking to clinic and walking out with patient data on paper? What's to stop anyone from right now recording us using our iPhone? I wouldn't know that. And what's to stop me from walking into the bathroom with my lavalier on? I mean, these are all real world problems that we have today anyway. But I think from a technology perspective, the fear factor is certainly, oh my gosh, it's new. But we don't have that safeguard today. So if you think about it that way, then... Well, yeah, but part of it is, is also the clandestine nature of it, right? The, the, the fact that, you know, if I'm going to videotape you, I'm holding the phone up. And you're, what are you doing? <laughs> right? You could be videotaping this whole thing, nobody would know. And so I think there are some challenges there. Yeah. And there have to, it's going to come in a couple of pillars, right? You're going to have social norms, yeah. right? Like, you can't walk into a casino with your glasses. They have a very vested interest in you not taking pictures of what's going on there. And, you know, and, and there's going to be social norms. There's going to be regulatory norms. Yeah. And, then, and then there's just going to be, you know, some level of the technology working, whether it's beacons in the bathroom and, and that kind of stuff. You can use different technologies to make it work. But it's a challenge, and it's interesting. You know, I, I saw a, a picture the other day, and this kind of goes back to the what are we doing, right? I saw a picture. Remember the days, it was one of these Facebook posts, but remember the days when we used to take pictures of our meals and then take the f film to get developed and then you bring it back? Like, no, but now for some reason everybody takes a picture of whatever they're eating and puts it on Facebook, right? It's like, what has happened? But it, it, this is going to spark the same kind of what are you taking a picture of kind of revolution, right? And, it's, on the fun side, I'm imagining uh, integrating reading with all of the other wonderful sensory stimulation that could come along with reading. And I can imagine, you know, my kids are Harry Potter freaks and so on, and they, their own imagination is pretty powerful, but if you're adding, you know, color changes or lighting changes while the words are flashing, I could see there's some really exciting things that could happen as entertainment, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, it's, it is really an ultimate con convergence technology. Yeah, I mean, slightly off topic, one of the, the consumer use cases that we actually did um, to, to test the market and test the market appetite was equipping uh, fans that were at a, an NHL game, our, our local arena. I'm, I'm based out of D.C., so Washington Capitals. Uh, at the Verizon Center, they're equipping people with uh, glasses and connecting glasses to the content management system. Uh, of the, the Verizon Center, so effectively tying into the same kinds of a video and uh, statistics source that is available to the Jumbotron operator and uh, bringing in real-time stats and uh, multi-camera angle replays. So for example, if you were sitting up in the, the 400 kind of a section and you just missed a goal, um, you would get notified, for example, that a goal happened and it would give you some baseline statistics on top of that and then it would step over into the next step where it'll give you replays of up to a dozen different camera angles for, for that goal happening. And the idea there is that you're, you're trying to take away from the people that are looking at their phones and kind of constantly doing this um, you know, at, at a sports game, which is all too commonplace today. So to bring to your point, so the, they already have lots of kids' books on iPad and what they can read them to you, and there's animations and stuff like that. You can actually interact with them and click on different parts of it. I don't know if you've seen any of those, but my son plays with them all the time. Um, my, my question is um, about employee uh, monitoring. And so, for example, when you have a smartphone, uh, your, your employer says, here's your smartphone, only use it for corporate use, but but a lot of times people will put their Gmail on it and they'll use it for everything. And there's actually been cases where people have returned their smartphones and left stuff on there that their, or their employer actually monitors whatever you're doing on that thing. So how do you think that is gonna play out when an employer gives someone a Google Glass and says, this is only, you know, you should use this for business use, but then they go home and they take it home and they use it for everything. And all of that stuff can be streaming back through some kind of clandestine Trojan back to the employer. If you're, yeah, I mean, if you're going through the, the typical type of a BYOD type of a strategy, mm -hmm. 
there, there exist platforms today where you can now, on a single device, you can separate out, you know, you can draw a hard line from a software, let's say a hardware firewall perspective of your personal data advice, mm -hmm. uh, the corporate data that you have. Um, seeing as these things run, for the most part, the same kinds of an operating system, it's not unreasonable to assume that that's going to be in place in, in a very short time in right. large deployments of glasses. I'm thinking more from a not BYOD perspective, but like your employer just gives this to you and says, here's your device. So. I know there's been some talk about rights management technology mm -hmm. to, to kind of basically pull out from the manager how the information is flowing through. Right, right. Yeah. So yep. I, I, I think that a lot of employees just will be thinking about it, just like with their smartphones. They don't think about it. Oh, I got a smartphone, and I'll just go and use yeah. it for whatever. It, it's a whole new level of IT of policy, right? Yeah, I mean, and I can take pictures of my meals and my poop and put it on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, yeah right, yeah. <laughs> People do that. It's weird. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's crazy. Well, you know, but it, it's also, an, there's an interesting, you know, we live in a litigious society, and there's an interesting litigious angle to this, right. which is now you've got a, a workforce outfitted with glass that may or may not be at any given point in time capturing the workforce environment when something happens. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? You know, there's going to be whole classes in law school about right. this, right? <laughs> and, that, and that's interesting. And whether it's, you know, we talk about the workforce, it could be in the pharmaceutical industry, it could be in any industry. Yeah. And, and the, it, there's right. an interesting evolution that we're going to need to go through. But if you look at, uh, there, uh, there was a picture of, you know, evolution, revolutions back in 2001 versus 2011, and the picture was different because in the 2011 version, everyone had their iPhone videotaped. Oh, yes. right. so, <laughs> so if you look at all the crimes, the bullying, and all the, I mean, everyone has an iPhone capturing video already. Right. Right. So this is just a different yeah. channel, but right. we already have it today. So yeah. whatever corporate policy had to occur for people having iPhones in the workplace, or in uh, I, I, environment. The, the standard is basically this is our iPhone and whatever you do with it, I can I can monitor. Mm -hmm. And there have been some cases where there's been like passwords or stuff left over after you've left that have had some legal questionability. But the legal standard right now is this: if you use your iPhone that the company issued and the company has a policy, they own that it. There's this, the, yeah. You can the, we can monitor everything. They can monitor everything you do with it. And a lot of people don't even realize that. But I think it gets a thousand times worse with class because now not only am I subjecting myself to that policy, but my whole family or everyone that I know. You could turn it off or take it off. As yeah, well. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I agree, but, but a lot of people just don't think about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, but I mean, if you think about it, this, is something that you can take off. Yeah. You know, if you look at Google contacts right. that are now yeah. measuring your tears for you know diabetes, right. now you're really getting into invasion of territory there yeah. because you're actually measuring bodily functions and, right. and fluids. Mm -hmm. Oh, useful. It's pretty easy. Voice activated swipe. It's a mouse pad swipe over here. I'm just swiping up and down. Um, one, one problem that we did come across is that if we all had Google Glass here and I say, OK, Glass, they all go off. They all go <laughs> yeah. off. Yeah. So, so I think there's a little bit more sensitivity that needs to be developed. It does measure, though, calibrate to my winking. So it calibrates my winking to take pictures. So I'm sure the next iteration will calibrate voice yeah, recognition to sensitive. There's an entire industry that, that uh, my company, for better or worse, is a part of, which deals with uh, the human-computer interface associated specifically around wearables. And that's not necessarily just limited to the, the kinds of modalities that are available as a baseline, which is voice and uh, touch. Uh, on glass today, you can also pull in other kinds of wearable devices um, to be able to to wake up your device or to to use kinds of gestures. Uh, we've even gone ahead and done some integration with uh, a leap motion sensor, which is a static camera-based type of a sensor. Uh, you know, using a lab environment as an example, you can have a you can have a leap motion sensor um, with glass, and you're you're working through some sort of a some sort of a, a standard type of an operating procedure, and you can flip through the next pages. Rather than doing this on the, uh, on the glass, now you can wave your hand over back and forth to be able to flip through pages. So there'll, there'll be a, 
whole bunch of different modalities that come out, but um, you know, there won't be, we, we don't think there won't be a single type of a user interface that's going to roll all. Yeah, well, and I think it's the same thing as, you know, we used to type like this, now we type like this, <laughs> right? It's the, same, it's the same kind of thing. There's, there's gonna be a, a, a little bit of a learning curve, but relatively intuitive. Mm. So like the, the gesturing you do with the Wii or the Kinects. Yeah, or the Kinects. Yep. Yeah, Kinects. So uh, you mentioned sensitivity. What's the sensitivity of the location? So is it, is it, how does it do, is it GPS or? Mm -hmm. So how sensitive is that? So can a server know that, that you, you two sitting next to each other, that can, is it, so can it find that closely and identify this glass is used by this person and two feet away that glass yeah. is? I think the eye beacons will start to provide that capability. The, the what? eye beacons are the internal GPS capabilities are being developed so that if you position three eye beacons in the room, it will triangulate your exact location in turn inside a building. So I think that's where Google and Apple, you know, obviously with the global mapping, they're trying to map the world, but they're also trying to navigate into malls, into stores and restaurants so right. that they can triangulate within um, internal in interior. So it's, it's no more accurate than your phone would be. And when you're inside and you don't have line of sight to, to satellites, you know, you're talking six, eight, 12 feet kind of accuracy. What about outside? Outside it'll be as accurate as your GPS. It can be yeah. pretty darn, you know, yeah. down to a foot or two. Yeah. Okay. Non-military non spec. Right. Okay. <laughs> Military guys, maybe. Um, you can deploy device. Can you consider doing right. Yes, right. absolutely. Right. And also, you can triangulate with Wi-Fi. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, beacons are beacons are largely based on a, a presence type of a platform where um, whether your your proximity right now, it's less so triangulation, but just based on pure um, receive signal strength. So if you're near a beacon area and you've got one beacon that's screaming and then you've got, you're seeing the other beacon but it's much lower, let's say 20 dBs or less, then the system effectively determines that you're, you must be near this beacon. Um, so there is, a, there is a theoretical limit in, you can't deploy beacons at you know, 30 centimeter distances and expect to get good results because then you'll, you'll start getting some signal washout. But, We've had a lot of success trying to deploy beacons uh, separated about 10 to 15 meters and, and getting that level of accuracy. What we've seen the, the most amount of success is, for example, in, a, in kind of a hospital room type of a setting, the system can tell you very, very, very exactly as to which room you're in or which corridor of the hallway that you're in. How do you deal with things like multipath? Straight RSSI of the, the beacons themselves. So multipath becomes a little less of an issue. So Jay, you've done work with the military, so have they tried to figure out like how accurately they can identify where that soldier is out in the field? Not necessarily in the middle of nowhere, but let's say in a, in a Sure, city I mean, or, uh, out in the field, there's, there's all kinds of military grade GPS that, you know, that's much, much more accurate than the, the, the conventional, you know, commercial ones. Okay, so there's a, a separate military band. Okay. I Whose saw, accuracy I can't tell you. Yeah, I saw a video <laughs> of uh, somewhere out in Middle East. I don't know, actually, I think it might be South Korea, where they had a drone deliver pizza to uh, to a customer out in, somewhere in the world. So, I mean, if you're talking about beacons and, and GPS, and we're getting to a world where drones are coming by and delivering what you need. And I think the other aspects about beacon is that you walk into a store and the value of Google Glass or any of the wearables is that if you're, I'm looking at a rack, immediately they can send inf me information about the clothing that I'm looking at based on my positioning of my head. And that's something that um, a phone wouldn't necessarily be able to provide you. Right. It's a question, but it's a question. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's an ease of use. It's, a, it's an accessibility yeah. issue. Yeah. Right. It's not really a technology issue. I mean, even thinking about nutrition, I mean, when I look at the, uh, all the vitamins, if you look at a vitamin shelf, for example, I mean, <laughs> can't figure out any of that. But if you could use that to tell me more information about that type of nutrition, what that's good for. But, that would be awesome. but even if it cross references with your medicine cabinet, because right, if right. it knows that you're taking these five drugs and you're about to buy a third one that counter, you know, counteracts with what you've already taken for the day, that can give you more immediate feedback. 
And that's where, um, in the world of pharma, that's really important because you don't want two drugs to be taken by a patient out while they're being tested on your drug, and it's a forbidden product on your protocol that you can actually use. Exactly. Three drugs that have Exactly. Well, or, or it's something as simple as, you know, as, as people are get, living longer and getting older, right? Have you taken your medicine today? <laughs> or, or you already took your medicine today, you need to stop, right? I mean, there's, there's all sorts of really interesting derivatives that's, that you can start to think about yeah. if you have this kind of ubiquitous acquisition platform. This can't help solve the paradox of remembering to take your, med your memory pills. It could. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? I hope the audience had fun. We sure did. Thanks for staying late. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for staying late. And hopefully it was worth it. I hope the beer helped. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm very well. Wait, no, no, no. I'm very proud of one cartoon I did find. Uh -oh. oh, where did? Oh, nope. I got to get to the end. Keep going. Hey, why is that cute? Yeah, he's, he's, totally he's got it for you. Oh, oh, well, uh, I think the next, next slide. There we go. On a low, Alfred E. Newman. <laughs> Top Google searches by people wearing Google Glass. <laughs> why is every pointing me and laughing? Yep. Closing the wear with incredibly stupid looking glasses. Our cross-eyed sperm <laughs> <laughs> is NSA spying on me, spying on people. <laughs> Emergency room directing. Yeah. Google lace. Yeah. Class action losses against Google, the search. Best lighting for taking up skirts. And best sites to sell unbought Google Glass. eBay. 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 Yeah, that's right. eBay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks and very I, much. And what, I promised you you were going to have the ex best experts in the country, and they delivered. <laughs>